have a good time on our own. Uh, so race is a problem, just as Denise and I were talking about. Uh, eyewitnesses are usually better at recognizing and identifying members of their own race or ethnic group than members of another race or ethnic group. Uh, this is termed other race effect uh, because we have a hard time identifying people of other races. Joe, how you doing? You can come in, that's okay, but you have to take your hat off. <laughs> Because not because it's a hat, but because no, it's a Bruce, no. it's the wrong no, team. It's the wrong Bruce, team. Bruce. <laughs> Stop it. Despite the fact they're going to win the national league, it looks like, or at least the, the West. Racial attitudes do not appear to be related to other race effects. Uh, why does the other race effect occur? Part of it has to be a uh, be, be because of uh, of a physiognomic uh, variability. And the other is in-group, out-group differences. So one is a cognitive interpretation, me trying to identify what race somebody is, and the other is the fact that they're not the same as I am. Yes, ma'am? So racial attitude, same thing as like prejudice? No, it's not. No, this, this doesn't have anything to do with, with racism, as strange as that seems. Yes, sir? Because he's got the Detroit Tiger, <laughs> Tigers hat on, and that that's fine. That's, that's fine. fine. That's fine. The Los, it's the Los Angeles Dodgers. These are just letters. Just think about letters. No, I can't do that. It's that's the Los Angeles Dodgers. My mother was a Dodgers fan. It was the only thing that was wrong with my mother was the fact that she was a Dodgers fan. <laughs> are you a Dodgers fan? <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't have you in class. I can't flunk you because of the baseball team. Right now. Not now. But you, you will flunk. I you will flunk you. Yeah, in the future. You're right. <laughs> faces of one race differ from faces of another race in terms of the type of physiognomic variability. White faces show more variability in hair color. Really? Hair color? Is that what we're looking at? And black faces show more variability in skin tone. If you want to, if, if you if you've ever been around African Americans and you've ever talked to these individuals, uh, and they've ever disclosed to you what they're really thinking, one of the things they think about is skin tone. That Spike Lee, his second movie was about was about skin tone, was about how uh, black uh, females who have uh, are light complexion. Those individuals are more acceptable than dark-complexioned females, as interesting as that is. So if you look at all of the uh, actresses who are African-American, how many of them are really, really dark? It's really odd to see somebody who is really, really dark. A good example would be uh, uh, Saturday Night Live. They have a woman on Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live that is a very dark African American woman. <laughs> but can you think of anybody else who's really, really dark? It's not so serious as far as males are concerned, but females, it's huge. And that's what the movie School Days is all about. It's about people trying to be as pale as they possibly can. Fascinating. It's really fascinating stuff. Hair texture has to do with, has a lot to do with it as well. Uh, the curlier the hair, the less acceptable it is. The straighter the hair, the more acceptable it is. One of the most uh, widely accepted African American uh, actresses would be Halle Berry, whose mother is white and whose father is black, but her hair is naturally straight. I know, this gets, this almost sounds racist, but the reality is it's them interpreting their own, their own people. Well, look at that, way back there. Okay. Yeah, I'll sit front and center. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, so, the next time you're around Belaganas and you look at them, the thing that you need to look at in order to identify them is their hair color, as strange as that may seem. Yeah, me. So what color do, hair do I have? I have a brother that is older than I am, but he has gray hair. 
I know it's gray. Mine's white. I don't understand. What was your hair color before? Uh, Blondish, brownish, that 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 in between brownish, blonde thing, light brown. Let's call it light brown. Can't see you with that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. No, I don't have a picture. <laughs> <laughs> what I looked at. So uh, one of the things that you need to notice is what color their hair is, uh, even with males. And, and now that males are growing beards, just how weird is that? Uh, now that white guys are, are growing beards, you can identify them by the color of their beard. I mean, you can dye your hair, but you can't dye your beard. Well, I guess you could. You can dye your mustache, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand any of this stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Of course, you can always dye your hair. But white people identify themselves by their, not only their complexion was, how dark was he, uh, but, all, but primarily by their hair color. Uh, African Americans, when an African American sees another African American, the first thing that they identify is how dark are they. And the darker they are, the more negative they see it. Okay, do you want realities about uh, American Indians? Some American Indians did exactly the same thing. So the darker you were, the less acceptable you were. Yeah. Um, and this happened to the Cherokee. The Cherokee took the long walk, the really long walk, from Georgia all the way to Oklahoma. When they got to Oklahoma, they tried to act white when they were in Georgia, but they, they still rejected them, and they kicked them over to, to Oklahoma. But so when they got to Oklahoma, they started... Uh, selective breeding of sorts to the extent that they were the lighter complexioned you were the more likely you were to find a, a mate and this was in boarding school so the the prettier the individual that was the lighter skin the lighter complexion that individual was more likely to marry and have children as strange as that may seem do other American Indians care about the, t the tone of your skin Probably not, but for the Cherokee, this was this was a really important thing, and there there is a uh, an article written about that. Uh, this was in the at the uh, the at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there's an article written about that, and, and you guys can read it if you like. But they talk about how uh, in that school, uh, the, uh, the 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 queen of the school or whatever, the princess, I don't know. Uh, whoever was the most beautiful person in the school was the lightest complexion person in the school. And they selected you not by the structure of your face, not by any other physical attribute, but by your skin tone, as odd as that may seem. That's one tribe, of course. That's just one group. But this may be one, another reason why people make fun of the, the Cherokee, because they were so light complexion. So a lot of these individuals were trying to find individuals, they were trying to marry white guys so that they would have a lighter complexion children and they would be more acceptable, as strange as that may seem. Okay. I know, this is all such strange stuff. It's sad, my daughter, when she just like was out in the sun for only 30 minutes, she gets dark. But at least she doesn't sunburn. Yeah. Isn't that much better? Mm -hmm. See, my kids are the same way. And for that reason, we thought that they were, they had uh, native ancestors. Mm -hmm. Or at least my wife told them they had native ancestors. When they go out in the sun, they turn brown. They don't turn red. I turn red if I go out, so. but they turn brown. And so we thought they had native ancestry. As it turns out, it was Italian ancestry. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, there was an actor that, uh, that, that portrayed a lot of... Um, uh, Indians. He's the one that had the the, uh, the advertisement where the, his, the tear trickles down his face. Remember that guy? He wasn't Indian at all. He had no native ancestry. He was Sicilian. He was from Sicily. And that's why he was dark and that's where, where he got his features. Even though they looked American Indian. And he was thought of as the quintessential American Indian. But the reality was he was Sicilian. I know, weird stuff. Okay. This is all important stuff. <laughs> For eyewitnesses to correctly identify members of the other race, they must focus on the characteristics that distinguish that person from other people of that same race. 
White eyewitnesses should look at the skin tone when identifying a black person. And they don't. Well, they don't unless you've been around a lot of black people. And then, and you've talked to a lot of black people, and you have black friends. Because then you understand how to identify this person from that person. Really? Yeah. That's pretty much the way it is. So you start, you, you don't, when you see somebody, you don't have to identify who they, what they are. If, if the more interaction you have, the less you have to do that. So don't, not all Asians look alike. Not all uh, African Americans look alike. Not all Belaganas look alike. Yes, they do. Okay, yes. Well, they don't if you look at their hair color. <laughs> Uh, you're not going to get me mixed up with uh, with Dr. Robinson, not the female Dr. Robinson, the other Dr. Robinson, Don. Oh, sometimes. Oh, sometimes. oh his hair's really short. <laughs> Come on, he's a Hindu. How could you get me mixed up with him? <laughs> I thought you guys were twins. We. <laughs> <laughs> when I first came here. Uh, we're both from Iowa. That's the interesting part. He came here from Iowa, and I came here from Iowa. We're both about the same height. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit more muscular than I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Research by Goldinger, he and Popish in 2009 monitor monitored eye movement of people as they were looking at a series of faces. The researchers discovered that the subjects fixated more on distinctive features when viewing their own race faces than when viewing different race faces. Okay, so the reality is, I'm a white guy, so when I see a white guy, I look at him longer. I look at, at the distinctive features on his face. But because I have a lot of black friends, and I've had a lot of black friends over the, over the years, when I look at a black face, I do the same thing. I try to identify them. I try to see the similarities between this individual and some of my, of my friends in the past. Okay, so I would be a good eyewitness because I've, I've lived in a lot of different communities. I've lived in black communities. I used to live in a black community when I lived in uh, up near Washington, D.C., Fort Washington and, and uh, Oxen Hills. It's a black community. And I was like one of three white people in the whole community. Now, the, that sounds a little bit strange, but the reality is when I went to the barber shop, they had a hard time cutting my hair. Because black hair is different than white hair. Okay. Yeah. And there was only one barber. They had seven barbers. And only one of those guys could cut straight hair. <laughs> the other guy said, yeah, you can come here, but you're going to look, you know, different. <laughs> And they thought it was funny. And I had to wait for that guy to, to, to uh, until his chair was empty, until I could go and get a haircut. As funny as that was. And then he'd make fun of me the whole time. Oh, I don't know if I like cutting straight hair. You can always tell when you make a mistake. On black hair, you can't tell if you make a mistake. <laughs> that's what he used to say. Anyway, okay, so that's, that's the way it is. Uh, the reality is that all... Five of these guys are the same guy. And of course, then you've got the African American gentleman in the middle and the, on the bottom. Uh, social psychologists also explain the problem of identifying other race faces through the in group, out group phenomena. Uh, when confronted by someone from our own group, we focus on distinguishing features. When we are confronted by a person from another group, our initial attention is identifying their group. So first of all, you have to identify their group. And this is the reason why Mariah Carey was so popular. People would look at her and they couldn't figure out what she was. And so they concentrated, they looked at her and they looked at her face, tried to determine if she was black, tried to determine if she was Hispanic, or tried to determine if she was white. And the reality was that she was all three of those. But she did have African ancestry. So when they looked at her face, they were trying to determine what she was. What she was was more important than who she was. And because of that, she became very popular. If people have distinctive features, 
then you, you pay more attention to them. Dolly Parton is a good example. Dolly Parton has a physical attribute that makes her distinctive over all the other country and western singers. And it ain't her hair. It's her tattoos? <laughs> I don't think she has any tattoos. <laughs> Maybe she does. Maybe she does. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they, and that became very distinctive for her, so she became a lot more popular than other country and western singers who potentially had better voices than she did. She had a distinctive little girl voice, which was kind of interesting. But it was that other physical attribute that made people concentrate on her. The evidence for gender effect is not overwhelming, but tends to indicate an own gender bias, at least for women. So women are better at identifying women, and men are better at identifying men, as interesting as that is. So a woman may look at a man and not really concentrate on his face, but if she looks at another woman, she's trying to determine if she's prettier than that other woman is, if she's younger than that other woman, if that other woman has done something to her face. So they know when a woman has had plastic surgery, and I can't tell, I don't know, I know Cher has because she can't move her upper lip. Yes, ma'am. Is that same that goes as gender, transgender? Can you uh, identify a transgender man? Yeah, sure. Kind of. Maybe. Okay. I'm guessing both the male and the female, uh, when they look at a transgender person, both of them are looking at features that don't quite fit. And they're thinking, wait a minute, she sure has a thick chin, she sure has a big chin, she has a big head. You know, why is her why does her hair start so far up on her forehead? Potentially, that's what the man is thinking. That's also probably what the woman is thinking. So they will spend a lot more time looking at their faces because things don't quite fit right. Does that make sense? No. Yes. Does it make sense? The transgender people. So you're looking at different things. Uh, I, have, I have a former brother-in-law who was transgender, and we had, he had this heavy beard. <laughs> he, uh, he became a female, but he had this heavy black beard. So he had to have uh, uh, electrolysis to take all those hairs out. And, uh, he, didn't. he was also bald-headed, which, I don't know. I like my women with more hair on top of their head than, you know back here. <laughs> he was not an attractive woman. In recent years, police have, have begun to incorporate procedures recommended by psychologists and others by interviewing eyewitnesses and constructing and presenting lineups. In 1999, the U.S. Department of Justice recommended procedures for collecting eyewitness evidence, procedures based on psychological research studies, and of course, with, uh, from that we came up with the cognitive model, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. A landmark decision by the New, uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court in 2011 uh, also issued in a, a new set of uh, rules for cases involving eyewitness identif identification. The decision lists more than a dozen factors that judges should consider in evaluating the reliability of an eyewitness identification. One example would be uh, the presence of a, of a weapon. Remember there is that, uh, that gun prejudice that we have. If we see somebody with a gun, we focus on the gun, not the individual. We keep our eye on the weapon. Uh, and an example would be, what, uh, what, how old was the guy that uh, was just on the other picture? How old was he? 150? 200? Was he a young man? Was he an old man? Do we know? What, what was he wearing? We don't know. Did he have a gun? No? Oh man, you guys didn't even watch. Wait a minute. Let's go back. Okay. Yeah. Sure he was. Okay. 
Oh, you three gummies. Okay. All right, so what do we know about the guy? What color was his coat? Black. Black? Black. Leather. What was it made of? Leather? Okay. Uh, young man, old man, somewhere? Old man? Does he have white hair? We can assume. Okay. I'm trying to look if he had glasses. Oh, pretty tall. Did he have glasses? Uh, yeah, he's got glasses. If he's a good shooter, he's got glasses on, so they need to, just to protect the eyes. That's blowing that guy's head off. Is that a shotgun? No. That's, that's, a, that's a rifle. That's like a 30 30. Jeez, he blows that guy's head right off. Luckily, it's not a real human being. It's a dummy. I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> Uh, according to the New Jersey State uh, versus Henderson 2011 ruling, uh, when a defendant presents uh, evidence that a, uh, that a witness's identification may be unreliable, the judge must hold a hearing to consider the issues and must give detailed instructions to the jury about the pitfalls of eyewitness evidence. And there are pitfalls. There are problems that they can potentially have. This decision is expected to have a nationwide impact. And we're going to start. We're going to talk about how they are interviewing these, uh, how the police are interviewing these select individuals that will potentially become eyewitnesses. Interviewing eyewitnesses uh, is a standard police interview. Uh, one relies on predetermined set of questions with little opportunity for follow-up. That's the way it used to be. Uh, now, of course, we use a different system. So, what color were that was that guy's eyebrows? What color were the, the other guy's eyebrows? Did the guy that was just in the picture? Black. Were they? Was like a unibrow. <laughs> Not what color was his hair? Green. Green hair, okay. Very distinctive, he had green hair. How about his hat? What color was his hat? Black. Was it? Did, did it say something on it? It did say something, didn't it? Yeah, Philadelphia. Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. Did you identify his race? Yeah. What color? African American. What color? He was pink. <laughs> I'm pink. It looks, it looks like he's colored in the dark. Yeah. Maybe it's just his eye color. Yeah, he's African American. Big lips. Yeah, I think he shaved his eyebrows and then painted them in. Yeah. That's kind of attractive. He's got a lot of makeup on, doesn't he? His eyes he's got makeup around his eyes. I don't know what that is. You wonder if his hat has hair, or if he has it. Because there are hats with hair. Try it. <laughs> Go buy a hat with hair. Get a pink bun. <laughs> the bigger the bun, yeah. the better, I guess. So, I think that's what we heard. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's kind of tell, tell Sue that. No, I'm, I was just kidding. No, <laughs> no but, you said it. It no. must be true. She said the bigger the bun, the better. And I repeated <laughs> what she said. In a cognitive interview, the interviewer establishes rapport <laughs> with the witness, uh, then asks the witness to provide a narrative account of the event, and finally probes for details with specific questions. The interviewer allows the witness to direct the subject matter and flow of the questioning, interrupts infrequently, and listens actively to the witness's responses. And if you've ever watched an interview on television where they were actually interviewing somebody, probably the policeman asked a lot of questions. However, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Uh, we were talking about uh, how you interview a child, uh, especially if they've been sexually molested. Uh, one of the things you have to be careful of is that you can't guide the questioning. So you can't really ask them any questions. You're just trying to get them to talk. And this is a subject that you're trying to get them to talk about. But it's the same way with, uh, with any interviewee. Uh, we try to get them to just give us a narrative. We try to ask as few questions as possible. We interrupt as infrequently as possible. Now that Arlene's here, she can tell you about how we question children. We were talking about this the other day. How you question children, especially if you think that they've been sexually molested. 
You were telling me, so it tells them. That you have to go to school and become a forensic reviewer. Right. For specific questions, mm -hmm. words. Yeah. Yeah. You all. Any word that you use may potentially be guiding. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be really careful as to what you say. And you have to go to school and get a what? You have to become a forensic interviewer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. There's a one I would like to share, like a, a question. I remember a, a couple years back, we were camping out and um, an incident happened a couple of feet, a couple of feet from our campsite, and uh, we thought it was just people just partying and having a good time, but and we slept it. What did you hear, Francis? We just seen her yelling and screaming, and we thought, okay, so that's, that's probably about it. Everybody, somebody's having a good time on the other campsite, and uh, the next day we got questioned by uh, authorities, and they told us what we heard. And they said, what did you hear? Did you hear, like, screaming, yelling? And they said, yeah, yeah. Was there, like, female or male? It's like, uh, maybe, we just don't know. It's like, it's we just went through the night, we just left alone. We don't want to go there and disturb that. We don't want to just get disturbed so we to, uh, I guess there was a homicide that took place in that, in that area. A homicide? <coughs> and they asked us, uh, I guess later we found out it was, a, it was three individuals. One who was a female, and the, there was two males. The victim was a male, and the suspect was a female. And uh, I guess what happened was the lady stabbed the guy with a scissor and oh. they used the rocks to, to beat him him. to death. Yeah. Oh my god. So that asking hey. questions about if there was a male or female and what did you hear? What kind of scream did you hear? And we saw they're just like they seem happy over there, but I guess that wasn't going on. <laughs> I'm guessing the happy people were the ones that were doing the killing, and the unhappy one was the one that was yeah, going to that's die. How, that's they how were having cool. a good time. <laughs> that's the difficult thing. <laughs> and you thought they were having a party. Yeah. Isn't that weird? So you can hear things, and sometimes you misinterpret what you're hearing. The other night I heard somebody yelling. Uh, it was a guy. Uh, so I went outside my whole gun and looked around to see if Don was up there beating yeah. somebody to death. You know, those Hindus are always beating people to death. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, but the, he wasn't, there wasn't anything. I was afraid somebody was hurting Don. That's what was anyway, so I went out to see what was going on. And I couldn't see anybody. But the other, and, and since it was a male voice, I didn't worry about it. If it had been a female voice screaming or sounding like they were having a good time, I probably would have reacted to it more, more. Assuming that a male can take care of themselves and a female. If a female is screaming, then that means that she's in trouble. And I don't care if a guy's in trouble, but if it, was, it had been a female, I would have felt responsible if something had happened that I had missed. Or a child's voice. I mean, if you hear a child in distress, yeah. don't everybody reacts to it. I mean, everybody does. So what if an elderly man was in distress? I probably couldn't tell how old they were just from their yelling. Yeah, yeah let the old, let the, let, the, let the males die, we don't care. Obviously, we don't care, right? <laughs> oh Fra Francis hears this guy getting beat to death. And and all he's responding to is the female voice that we hear. Yeah. yeah, having a good time. Yeah, I mean it's it's natural, I guess. Kind of. Kind of. Uh, so how about no? female? Do we respond to males yelling? I'm sorry. Do we? Does do us females respond to males like yelling? I'm guessing not. If you heard two guys fighting, would you go out and try to break it up? Popcorn and watch. <laughs> exactly. That's what that's what Francis was doing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, if you had known he was in distress, I'm sure. I would probably call the police. He thought that they were having a party. I still, 
He interpreted it as a part. I, I would just call the cops. It, it, it started out like that. Like yeah. they're laughing and I guess they're yeah. sharing their truth. Is that wrong? Mm -hmm. I'm um, sorry. Is that normal? Like, for yeah. example, like the other night I heard somebody yelling, like not too far from sure. that. But it was a male, so I was, I, I was more afraid, so I locked the door. And I, okay. So, that's, but if it was a female, I think I would have met her. There you go. That's, that's the but thing. I think the response right. is, 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 is different. Sure. Exactly. Exactly. My husband was telling me a story on the good <coughs> day. Like, in the middle of like, an afternoon, by Totsuo Trading Post, where all those like bushes are at. Those, right. Um, those bushes. I guess there was a lady that was getting raped oh, in those no. bushes, and um, he was outside with his uncle. And his uncle, he was a former policeman, and I guess he ran over there. And my husband decided to run over there and try to like get that guy off of her and stuff like that. It was crazy. Yeah. So how did they identify that something was going on? Was it from her yelling? Mm -hmm. yeah. She was screaming across the room and stuff right. like that. So it's natural for us to try to protect somebody that's weaker, somebody that's potentially smaller. Uh, just like Travis was saying, if he heard two guys yelling at each other, he probably wouldn't respond to it at all. He locked his door. Um, a couple of years ago, somebody in the trailer court was screaming at somebody that I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. So I called up security. <laughs> I just called up security and I sent him out there. Uh, and the next day they actually responded. Yeah, it's going to be Yeah. Anyway, I don't think there were any dead bodies over there. But it, somebody was going to kill somebody. It's else. terrible though getting like security and police to even do anything around here. You know, because I go back and forth between like people, I don't know why, I'm like the mother of my complex or something. Everyone always comes to me when they've got a problem. Or, That's a big complex what, too. Yeah, or whatnot, you know. So. They always come to my door and knock on my door all hours of the night. And I'm like, they're like, can you call the cops for us? You know, and I'm like, where's your phone? You know, it's like, I know you have a phone. What is up with you? You know, I'm like, all right, well, then go back over there. I'll call you. And then goes the back and forth, back and forth. You know, I call the security. Can you call the PD? And the PD, can you call security? And none of them responds. And guess who I call? I call Window Rock. And I have Window Rock PD get after these guys over here for them to come help. Oh my goodness gracious. Sometimes I was they even have to call Shiprock PD, you know, just in the state over for them to call, call them to let them know something is up. So does Saley Acres, is that controlled by the school? No. So they, if you called security here, they, they wouldn't... Don't care. They I mean, wouldn't there care. was a, one of the families that lived there um, almost died of, um, what's that called? Um, you know, the carbon monoxide... Oh, carbon from, monoxide poisoning. Yeah, from the from the, the faulty fire right. stove. Right. And I went over to my friend's house that morning and had not, I not gone over to ask for, you know, sugar, sure. they would have never woke up. You know, so I went over there and knocked on their door and I was like, it stinks in here. I was like, you guys should open the window. I was like, you guys should, should come right. out. And you know, my, my friend, he was like really groggy and he didn't even know what happened. And then later, later on he called me, he's like, Steph, he's like, I didn't even know you came by this morning. Oh my goodness gracious. Like, I didn't know. And they had a little baby there. They had some minors there too as well. And I, they even had trouble calling PD and they had trouble getting security over there. And they had to have everybody else help call them to report the same thing in order for them to react. And then finally security showed them. Finally the fire department showed them. Finally the PD showed up. Babies die first. Their lungs are smaller. Mm -hmm. ah. So that was pretty scary for yeah. us, you know, to go through that. That is so it, it's, sad. it's so nuts and it's terrible. That's why for me, like my reaction time is different. Like it doesn't matter if it's a male or female screaming. You know, right. I will, I will react in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Well, potentially, if you, if it's a male screaming and you go over, then you might get into a fight. Mm -hmm. That's always a possibility. That's but then again, you won't get into a fight. But if, yeah, but if Travis and I go over there, you guys will have to. Yeah, because yeah, yeah potentially. <laughs> yeah, because usually I show so up like a baton or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the smart thing for for us to do is to lock actually lock the door. You are absolutely correct. Okay. <laughs>
the interviewer may cue a witness to mentally reconstruct the physical and emotional experiences that existed at the time of the crime. The interviewer may direct the witness to form an image of the situation, uh, recollect sights, uh, sounds, smells, and physical conditions, uh, for example, the heat, the cold, the darkness, and recall any emotional reactions experienced at the time. Now, the reason they want to know about the emotional reactions is because they want to know how skewed their, their recollections are. And, of course, the stronger the emotion, the more skewed, potentially, uh, their recollections will be. They're trying to figure out what's going on. When the witness has mentally reconstructed the event, the, interviewers, uh, the interviewer asks for a detailed narrative and then uses follow-up questions to probe for specific information. So they allow this individual to, to just talk. Uh, they, they have asked them for a narrative. They've written it down. Now they're going to ask them to, to talk about it again. They're, they want them to give them a second narrative. So they're going to compare the first narrative with the second narrative to see if there's any uh, differences. Now they, can, they, can, uh, they will follow up with questions after they've already told the story twice. Witnesses are sometimes asked to recall events in a diff different temporal uh, order, uh, such as uh, describing it uh, back to front instead of front to back uh, from a, a time frame, uh, a different time frame. So what was the last thing that happened what happened uh, uh, before that? What happened before that? So they'll, they'll tell the story backwards. And of course, if they can still, still tell the story backwards the same way they told it the first and the second time, now we know that this is probably true. Uh, well, of course, uh, they will ask them, uh, what do you think this other guy saw? The, somebody else that was there? What, were, what was the guy on the ground feeling? What were they thinking? Uh, they asked uh, from a different point of view, uh, from different people. Uh, and of course, that it really doesn't matter. <laughs> what doesn't matter is well, what they're really trying to do is get the same story a fourth time. So it, if uh, from the, this, this individual, what do you think that guy saw? You know, this guy was 15 feet away. What do you think he saw? If they say exactly the same thing that they just said, then probably this is all true. If you're not, like, what, what, what you were saying about how, uh, like, what I, what I, um, uh, was, how I was questioned, they probe it. Exactly. And they say, what, well, what time did you hear this part? Yeah. And then that's, well, right here they sound that jolly and happy. Right. And it died out. So they're right there. And exactly. The back part, well, what time would you woke up in, like, during the day or right. at night? Did you hear anything or nothing? What did you hear? How many people did you do with there? Stuff like that. So. How many did you think were over? Uh, could you identify them? No. I have to say, I, I could probably just hear like maybe three. Three different voices. That was right on the spot. Three, yeah. voices, three or four voices. Um, actually, pretty much they were drinking. They were happy at the beginning. And then yelling. And then it was tied up. Of course. The fact that they were drinking, you were assuming that because you didn't actually see them. Yeah. All you did was hear them. Yeah. So since they were happy and then they got less noisy, uh, then you assume that they were drinking and they had gotten drunk and so now they were less effusive yeah. or whatever, I guess. And then the next day the uncle, and then later on we heard about what happened. So I was like, okay, so never mind, I can't think about how it unfolded. So, so how the individual stabbed the person and later um, used rocks to, to beat them to death. Oh my goodness gracious. Not a fun way to go. Actually, the first time they hit you in the head, you're pretty much knocked out. So, yeah. We don't worry about the rest of it. So the next time you hear somebody partying and drinking, I don't have one of those horns. <laughs> You're going to go over and find out what's going on. <laughs> See, there, there's too many rocks around. <laughs> the cognitive interview. <laughs> you might get stabbed. <laughs> exactly. Be careful. So the, Don't ask Travis and I to go with you. We're going to lock the door. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a lousy joke, but that part of the area, they would say, um, so this is where they were playing paper, rock, scissors. Because the lady that stabbed the Oh, had scissors and, and they, they used rocks to, to death with a rock. Ugh. Rochambeau, paper, rock, scissors. Get it? Yeah. 
<laughs> Paper, rock, scissors. She stabbed him with the scissors and she beat him to death with a rock. Uh, paper, okay. Did. The only thing we're missing her is the paper. Because he was paper. <laughs> <laughs> the cognitive interview. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. We're horrible. Yeah. We're horrible. <laughs> we're not psychology students. I know, I know. Well, I'm a terrible person. Paper, rock, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> the cognitive interview has been shown to generate substantial increases in correct recall, though it can also product, produce a small increase in incorrect details. And this is known as a cognitive interview, where you let the person think as much as they possibly can, and it's referred to as the cognitive interview. Now he's told you the story four times, and of course you've written it down all four times or recorded it four times, now you're going to compare the stories to make sure that all of his facts are the same. If he has lied and at any point, or if he's lied two or three times, it'll be difficult for him to tell the same lie uh, identically three or four times. It's going to be very difficult because he'll have to remember. The problem is he's got cognitive dissonance. He remembers what actually happened, but here he's trying to inject uh, a, a fabrication so he, it's going to be difficult for him to remember that four times. He may make a mistake and remember the truth and tell you the truth at, in, during one juncture, one of the stories. It's more likely to happen because remember, well, while he's telling his story, uh, as long as he's telling the truth, it's all the same story. It's always the same way. But if he's trying to lie, when he's thinking about, I need to lie this time, He's also thinking about the truth. So he has those two pieces of information in his mind. The more he tells that story, the more likely he's going to tell the truth on one of those times, forgetting that this is a lie and this is what I have to say. And it usually starts with something very simple. It usually starts with something that doesn't have to do with, I shot the guy in the head. Uh, it may have to do with, uh, where he was or what he was doing. So if he tries to lie, it's going to be difficult for him to tell the same story four times in a row. Does that make sense? Okay. And all you're trying to do is catch him in one small lie. So if he has fabricated five or 15 or 20 different uh, pieces of information, he's got to remember all of those pieces of information at the right time with, with the other story in his brain at the same time. So it, one of those stories, he's going to slip. He's going to tell a lie. Or he's going to actually disclose that he's told a lie. And that's where you would look at emotional response? Well, the, one, one of the reasons you're looking for emotional response is because you're trying to determine uh, how accurate his observations are. So if he was scared, and I was <laughs> hiding and scared, and this is what I heard, well, potentially, have you ever have you ever yawned while you're listening to listening to your favorite song? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't sound the same, does it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're scared and you're you're hiding someplace, you're tightening all your muscles, you're not going to hear the same way as if you were relaxed. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what they that's what they're they're looking for. They're looking for discrepancies. An, investigate, a little of an investigator should instruct the witness that the offender... Oh, I'm sorry. This is a lineup instructions. Uh, an investigator should, ins should instruct the witness that the offender may or may not be present. Uh, without this instruction, eyewitnesses may assume that their task is to pick someone uh, so they choose the person who looks the most like the perpetrator, assuming that he's in the lineup. But, of course, you have to tell them that he may not be in the lineup so that they just won't pick somebody randomly. Uh, yeah, this looks like him, but he didn't have the tattoos. Well, yeah. Well, it looks just like him. He was about that height and about that weight, but uh, he didn't have the tattoos. No, that's not going to work. Yeah. Pick the, the guy that's closest. Uh, in a traditional lineup, all lineup members are shown to, to the witness at once. Uh, this is known as a simultaneous presentation. So if you've ever seen it on television, uh, if you've ever watched the movie... Uh, uh, wait a minute, what is it? The one about witnesses. Uh, usual Suspects. Great movie. Fantastic movie. Yeah, Usual Suspects. 
uh, they, they're all lined up together and they all have to say the same thing. Uh, that's known as a simultaneous presentation. So if you've seen it in the movies, probably it was a simultaneous presentation. Everybody was lined up together. An alternative is to show the lineup members sequentially. This is known as a se sequential presentation. The witness uh, uh, makes a decision about each lineup member before uh, seeing the next one. Now there are problems with both of these. Uh, if you have everybody lined up together, uh, then they're going to pick out the one that looks the most like the person, uh, the, the individual that uh, actually was the perpetrator. If you do it in a sequential fashion, what will happen is that they will make a determination after seeing each individual one. So they are deciding whether this person looks more like, like the individual or not. So we get mistakes in both of them, unfortunately. The manner in which a lineup is presented can affect the accuracy of the identification. Uh, in general, sequential lineups result in fewer identification attempts, uh, so both mistaken and accurate identifications are reduced. So in the sequential situation, they are less likely to identify somebody that actually did it than if it was if they had a simultaneous uh, presentation. Now, looking at uh, all six of these African-American gentlemen, if you look at them correctly, you can see that they all look very much different. And one of the reasons that you're looking at them, now that we've told you about how you, you identify African-Americans, the first thing that you should be looking at is their skin tone. And seeing which ones are, are lighter complexion than the others. That's the way you, and, and then you can, you can properly identify the fact that none of them actually look alike. But if you just looked at that picture initially without looking at their skin tone, you might think, wow, they all kind of look alike, don't they? They all have uh, full lips and they all have uh, big noses. Do they? This guy's got a skinny nose. That guy's got a skinny nose. This guy's got long hair. Anyway, yeah. So if we, if we were doing this properly, if you were, if you, uh, were African American, uh, the first thing that you'd note is the fact that their skin tone is different. And that's how African Americans identify each other. <clears throat> However, if, if, uh, if I'm white and I'm looking at, at them, what do I de identify first as a white guy? Skin tone. Sorry? Skin tone? No, or I'm white. You, oh. I'm white. Okay. What do I identify? Hair color, right. Well, they've all got black hair, so that doesn't, it's not going to work at all. They all look alike. Sure, they all look alike. They've all got black hair. But one doesn't have No, they've all got hair. This guy? Yeah, he's got, yeah, you can see his hair. He's got some hair. I was going to say, like, for some women, I guess, you know, because we're always in, like, into makeup and a lot of, like, face shapes, you know, describe a person by the type of face they have. You know, the guy has a narrow face, the guy in the middle has like a heart-shaped face, and the one on the side is a long, a long shape, you know, a bottom circle, and the one in the middle is like a diamond shape. But since they're male, yeah. you don't look at males the same way you look at females. Okay. Females you're comparing yourself to. Them. You kind of do? Yeah. I'm kind of obsessed with myself. Yes. <laughs> 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 so I look at everybody the same kind. Uh, of. I'm more macho than you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a lot more macho. <laughs> why, why are there uh, more mistaken identities in simultaneous lineups? Uh, in a simultaneous lineup presentation, eyewitnesses tend to tend to identify the person who looks most like the culprit relative to the other members of the, of the group. And this is known as relative judgment. So you're trying to find the guy that looks the most like that individual. As long as the perpetrator is in the lineup, the relative judgment process works well. But if the perpetrator isn't in the lineup, then they're going to identify the wrong person. They're going to identify the person that looks the most like the individual that was actually the perpetrator. But if the actual culprit is not shown, the pos a positive identification may still occur because someone in the group will always look most like the culprit. 
In a sequential lineup, the eyewitness compares each member in turn to his or her memory of the perpetrator, and on that basis decides whether any person in the lineup is the individual who committed the crime. An absolute judgment. So the, the uh, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about the sequential lineup, a little bit better than the, uh, uh, the simultaneous lineup. The typical lineup is the lineup is typically conducted by the detective who selected the fillers and knows which person is the suspect. And you, normally, what they'll they'll have are, are two potential suspects, and everybody else is a filler. Usually, they're a cop or somebody that has similar clothes to those individuals. Uh, there tends to be a policemen that are plain clothes policemen, and they tend to be the fillers a lot. Uh, a lineup administrator's knowledge of the suspect's identity can increase the likelihood that an eyewitness will choose someone more likely than the administrator has failed to provide instructions that the suspect may be in the lineup. So they're going to identify somebody in a simultaneous lineup. So they just get extra people on the side of the road and ask them? No, usually they, it's, it's another policeman. But usually it's somebody that they know can't possibly be the, the perpetrator and they'll usually use a, a policeman. Almost all police departments have individuals that are pl either plainclothes policemen or they're undercover. Uh, well, it all depends on where we are. Uh, if we were here, of course, they wouldn't probably use a lineup at all. Mm -hmm. No. But if we were in the city, if we were in New York or Chicago, lineups are very common. Um, anyway. Yeah, the more rural it is, the less likely you're going to have a lineup. Ideally, the lineup should be administered by someone who does not know which person is the suspect because they will, they will key that individual. They will look at that individual. And when the, uh, the uh, eyewitness is looking at the, all the uh, individuals standing there, they will look at the person that is running the uh, lineup to see which one they're looking at as strange as that may seem. So they will look at the same guy and they will see him as the potential suspect. Now the problem is that this guy is looking at the, the suspects. They're not looking at the cops or they're not looking at the other suspects or the ones that aren't suspects. They're looking at the suspects to make sure that that suspect isn't doing something to, to hide their, their uh, appearance. You know, slouching down or, or closing their eyes or, or whatever. Kind of, kind of cringing a little bit so that the person can't see them very well. So that's the problem. So it, usually it's somebody, the person that, that is running the uh, lineup should be somebody that has no clue who the suspects are. Of course, they, all, they always know who the, who the normal people that they have in the lineup are anyway, the policemen. Eyewitnesses sometimes express an increased certainty in their identifications as a result of events that happen after they choose someone uh, from the lineup. If the eyewitness receives confirming <coughs> feedback from the lineup administrator. And you have to be careful because if they pick the right guy, if they pick the suspect, usually the policeman, the person running the show, will go, oh, okay, you know, and it's all over with. If they choose the wrong guy, they'll go, are you sure? Look, look uh, at, at, at all the, the people in the lineup again. So in, in reality, they're cueing who they want them to, to pick. They want them to pick the suspects. So if it's a suspect, they don't go, are you sure? Come on. You look at all those guys again. They don't usually do that, and that's the problem. You know, policemen aren't psychologists. Police were policemen, and they want the right guy. They want to arrest the right person, and they know who the suspect is. So when they get the suspect uh, is the chosen one, then they react positively to the, uh, to the uh, eyewitness. Confidence expressed by the eyewitness is one of the most compelling reasons why jurors believe such identifications are accurate. Uh, the jurors think that uh, this individual identified them from the lineup, therefore it must be true. Even though there are all kinds of cues that the uh, policeman can use uh, to get them to identify the right person. 
Studies have shown that witness confidence is not a very good predictor of a witness's accuracy unless it is measured immediately after, a, after an identification. So uh, one of the things that ha has happened uh, with the Kavanaugh situation is that the individual that accused him of exposing himself to her when she was a freshman, in, when he was a freshman in, uh, at Yale University, uh, this individual said that initially she was 60% uh, sure that it was him after she thought about it. The reality is that if somebody exposes themselves to you and you find it repugnant, then you will probably try to repress that memory. That, that's very logical. You try not to think about it. So for 35 years, she hasn't been thinking about being uh, have, uh, having a, a, an individual uh, display themselves to her. She hasn't thought about that. But uh, so when she first uh, realized that it may, may have been Brett Kavanaugh, she started asking friends who had been at that uh, at the same party if this is a possibility. Was Brett Kavanaugh at that party? And so eventually, you know, it took her a couple days, but eventually she realized it was Brett Kavanaugh that displayed himself to me. She's 100% sure now. And of course, she's not going to testify. Hmm. She's not going to. They're not going to, going to allow her to testify. The only person that's going to testify is is Christine Blasey Ford from California, Professor Ford. She's a professor of psychology. Interestingly, I know, professor of research uh, methods at, uh, at Palo Alto in California. Anyway, yeah, I know she's one of us. I know. <laughs> You're hot dog. Anyway, so the, the Ramirez, uh, before she made the accusations, she thought about it and she tried to determine what is the percentage of, of uh, surety that I have. Am I sure that it was Brett Kavanaugh? Uh, okay. <laughs> Asking witnesses to uh, provide a statement of their degree of certain certainty before giving them any feedback can be an effective way to eliminate the problem of false confidence. The reality is that nobody should be 100% uh, sure that this is the individual. It's probably going to be in the 90% range or the 75% range. Now the problem is that if you say I'm 75% certain that this guy is the one that did it, the defense attorney is going to jump on that and say well there's 25% uncertainty that this is the guy that did it. So you almost have to be 100% uh, sure before they can uh, use you in a court of law. Jurors put a great deal of weight on testimony from an eyewitness. In 1974, Loftus gave, a subjects, gave subjects a description of an armed robbery resulting in two deaths. 18% of those presented with only circumstantial evidence against the defendant convicted him. Only 18% decided he was guilty. 72% convicted uh, when an eyewitness ID, uh, ID uh, was pre presented to them. So juries are more likely to accept eyewitness accounts. Here we have 18% when there was just circumstantial evidence. When there was eyewitness accounts, 72% convicted this individual of murder. Jurors have baseline expectation that, expectation, uh, that eyewitnesses are accurate. Jurors assume that eyewitnesses' uh, testimony is a reflection of their memory quality and not the way that they were questioned or interacted with the lineup administrator. Uh, and this, of course, is fundamental attribution error. They assume that it is, it is accurate. They assume that the police didn't make a mistake. They assume that the eyewitness didn't make a mistake. They assume that they knew who this person was and they were able to identify them from a lineup. That is the assumption. But the reality may be that they picked the guy that looked the most like him. Remember at the beginning of the chapter, we talked about those two individuals that were, that eyewitnesses, uh, the individual that, that was raped, identified them as the perpetrator. And in both cases, the DNA didn't fit. Now, a guy can have sex with a woman, but it's really hard for him to ejaculate somebody else's semen. That's almost, that is impossible. You can only ejaculate your own. <laughs> so it's impossible for the DNA to be incorrect. 
that's not possible. Now it's possible for if you have a twin brother that your twin brother may have done it and you might get accused of it because you look alike. Your DNA is so similar. Yeah. So you might get arrested for your twin brother, which is a possibility, but I don't have a twin brother, so I'm okay. Jurors over rely on an eyewitness's confidence uh, with gauging accuracy. A lot of times they make mistakes. Uh, so it's not that interesting, it's not that, that odd uh, that the two individuals that we looked at at the beginning of the chapter were African American. And both of the individuals that were the, um, were the victims were both white. Remember, white people have a difficult time identifying African Americans. They look at them incorrectly, especially if they haven't been around a lot of African Americans. As strange as that may seem. So these two individuals, as soon as they discovered DNA, of course, uh, they were both exonerated. They weren't the ones that did it. Jurors could be informed about whether investigators allowed the Department of Justice guidelines for conducting lineups. Eyewitness testimony could be limited. Uh, they could allow psychologists who are knowledgeable about the research on perception and memory to testify. Uh, because very often eyewitness accounts are inaccurate. But how many jurors are uh, knowledgeable enough, enough to ask if the Department of Justice guidelines were conducted uh, uh, during the lineups? How many people are that knowledgeable? So who has to do it? Who, who needs to, to find out if this lineup was done correctly? has to be the defense attorney, because most jurors aren't that well-versed in, in uh, how lineups are supposed to work. So it has to be the defense attorney. Judges could uh, instruct juries about the potential weaknesses of eyewitness IDs and suggest how, how to uh, interpret uh, this uh, type of testimony. Judges could limit eyewitness testimony. For example, a judge could rule that due to the particular eyewitness conditions in a case, portions of or all of the eyewitness testimony will not be admissible. And a lot of times that's what happens, especially if it's dark. But how many, how many men rape women in, in the daytime? Not very often. It's not very safe, for one thing. You can be seen for miles. However, in your husband's case, that was during the day, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. As strange as that seemed. What an odd time to be raping somebody. Uh, the, expert tasks, the expert's task is to provide the jury with a scientifically based frame of reference within which to evaluate the eyewitness, uh, eyewitness's evidence. Uh, it does not tell the jury what to believe about a particular eyewitness or whether the eyewitness is accurate. Uh, so it's at, um, at that point, uh, we bring in an uh, expert witness uh, to talk about how, what's, what is the possibility of this being accurate. Uh, expert testimony tends to sensitize jurors to problems in witnessing and identification procedures, and of course there are always problems. People can misidentify people unless they know them. In 1976, the wealthy Hannigans caught three illegal Mexican aliens on their property. They tortured them, and then they chased them back across the border. That sounds sweet. Uh, tried in the same court, uh, brothers Thomas and Patrick Hannigan were given simultaneous trials. Uh, Thomas was allowed an expert witness. Patrick was convicted, and Thomas was acquitted because one had an expert witness and the other one didn't. The one with the expert witness was acquitted, and the one without the expert witness was convicted. And these are the three uh, Mexican gentlemen that they tortured, as strange as that may seem. The defense sometimes requests that jurors be alerted to the limitations of eyewitnesses. Uh, the judge decides whether to grant the request. And usually this, is, this uh, happens at the beginning of the trial. Uh, the uh, defense attorney will try to get the eyewitness testimony thrown out. And it's up to the judge to decide whether the eyewitness testimony is accurate enough 
to, uh, to be uh, allowed in court. What effects do cautionary instructions have on jurors' beliefs about eyewitness uh, test, uh, accuracy? Uh, the Telfair instructions uh, reduced mock jurors' sensitivity to eyewitness evidence, probably because that instruction gives little indication how jurors should evaluate the evidence. Uh, so it really didn't change it all that much. These findings provide some hints about the type of jury instruction that could reduce the, the likelihood of mistaken convictions in eyewitness cases. Those instructions as yet untested are likely to be issue specific, tailored to the facts present in a particular case, and based on scientific research findings. This is really tough. This is a really tough one. How in the world do they decide whether this eyewitness account is, is going to be allowed in court or not? And even if it's allowed in court, what are they going to tell them about the eyewitness account? Potentially the judge could tell them that this is often inaccurate and no matter what the, the eyewitness says, they're not going to believe them. And of course this is one of the reasons why defense attorneys are, are always attacking eyewitness accounts. Children over the age of six can have reasonable, reliable identifications from lineups provided that the perpetrator is actually in the, line, in the lineup and the child had extended contact with the perpetrator. One of the, the problems with children, I don't know if you remember when you were six years old, but uh, the probability is that you didn't look a lot of adults in the face. So if somebody, if a stranger came over and they only came over one time, you probably couldn't identify them because you didn't make eye contact with them. You didn't look at their face you potentially didn't have anything to do with that select individual. However, if you saw them over and over and over again, of course it's much easier for you to identify that, uh, that individual. Children are general, generally less accurate than adults when making an identification from a lineup in which the suspect is absent. They pick someone else, they make a false positive. False positive errors are very common uh, because they identify the individual that is the closest to the individual uh, that they uh, that was the perpetrator. Uh, I was talking to my grandson the other day. He's uh, he's six. Uh, his his uh, his best friend is green. In his class, I know he's green. Really, he's a green kid. There's a kid that's green in his class. It's a male. I, I figured that one out. But why in the world is he green? Probably because of his shirt. What's his his his, his, his uh, sweatshirt's green? Mm -hmm. So his best friend is. And finally, the kid's got it. He's finally got a name. His name's Elijah. Is his best friend. <laughs> Turns out that Elijah is actually shorter than Reese. Reese is not very tall. People in my family aren't very tall. But Reese is one of the shortest kids in the class. But Elijah is actually smaller than he. And he's green. <laughs> he's also African American, which is, makes it kind of interesting. <laughs> so his best friend is green. Yeah, and this is the way kids identify people. They identify people by their hairstyle, uh, by what color their hair is, uh, maybe what color ribbons they put in their hair, whatever, what color bar barrettes they wear. I don't know. You know, their backpack. She's a uh, uh, My Little Kitty. Really? She's a My Little Kitty? What does that mean? She's got a My Little Kitty backpack. Or something. Yeah. As weird as that is. My, fun, my son has a fun and interesting way of um, like color people, you know, skin tones. Right. He calls um, Caucasian people, you know, he says, Mom, those aren't white, those are pink. Pink. So I'm a pink person. Yeah, and then with the African Americans, you know, he hears them, he hears themselves call themselves black, and he's like, they're not black, they're brown, and they're dark brown. I was like, well, if they're brown, what color are we? And he's like, we're like yellow brown, and we're light brown. And then his sister's a lot more lighter than we are. And I was like, well, what color is Ariel? And he's like, um. She's New York cheesecake yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta write that one down. <laughs> New York cheesecake yellow. That's a color. Okay. That's a color. So you know, it's funny. You know, he describes people. 
you know, certain skin tones compared. Well, he called her New York New, New York cheesecake yellow because she's always eating cheesecake, New York ah, cheesecake. She's the same color. So she's the same skin color. tone as New York cheesecake. cheesecake. That's interesting. <laughs> Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't know that there was, I didn't know that people were different. Mm -hmm. my, my parents didn't tell me that there were people that, that were referred to as, at, at that time they called, referred to them as Negroes. And I didn't understand. And I had played with these kids and we had been around them all of our lives. And uh, then finally, it was my neighbor that referred to this individual as different. I, didn't, I never saw them as any different than anybody else. And you know, some people have a tan and some people don't have a tan. And some people are really pale and some people have red hair. And some people have black hair. I don't know where I can I don't know what's like brown hair where I can. <laughs> or red hair or blonde hair. But uh, yeah, very few. But here we have these other individuals with a different skin tone. I didn't realize skin tone was so important. Mm -hmm. I know. I was ignorant. And I'm still not real bright, so it <laughs> doesn't help a lot. <laughs> Possible solutions, uh, giving the children an option to say not, that they're not sure. Uh, the problem is that you're trying to get the child to give you information so that you can deal with the, with the information they give you. So you're trying to get them to say a yay or nay, but you have to give them the, the right to say, I'm not sure. Just like it's the same way with uh, women who have been sexually abused or sexually assaulted. You need to give them the right to say, I'm not sure if this is the guy or not. And that's what Ramirez was dealing with. She was only 60% sure when she first decided she was going to say something about Brett Kavanaugh. Because the reality is that Brett Kavanaugh was a party person when he was a freshman in, in, uh, in college, when he was a senior in high school. He was a party guy. He went, he, his best friend was the biggest drunk in, uh, at, at, in the high school. So he was kind of a party guy. And people identified him as a party guy. But, of course, we can't say that. I mean, you can't, you're not allowed to say that. So the reality is that, that we need to give people the right to say, I don't, I, you know, I'm not really sure. But the police don't want that. The police want a yay or a nay. They want a yes or no. They don't want a maybe. Maybes don't fit very well. Well, isn't that a problem with them? Ramsey, John Ramsey's brother. Oh, right. You know, the, the documentary that they released not too long ago, the, the interrogation. That it wasn't questioning, it was pretty much interrogating the right. kid. And they were just like really showcasing how he was just nonchalant about everything. But it's like, he's a kid. Yeah. Like, what do you expect him to exactly. do? Like, I mean, he's not an adult, he doesn't know what just happened. Right. You know, so they kind of made him, I don't know, kind of incriminated him. And I think because of that, totally jacked them up now as an adult. Yeah, I, I don't think it was him. <laughs> I think it was somebody else. I think it was the mom. I'm pretty sure it was the mom. What do you think? You don't know the case, Jean Benet Ramsey. This beauty queen that's what eight years old eight years gets old. raped and murdered in her basement. And the last person to see her alive was her mom. It was her mom. And she wasn't, she was raped, it, she, it, it was instrumental rape. She was, yeah, sodomized. Yeah. Sodomized by, uh, with a paintbrush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. not important. Yeah, it's a really weird case, yeah, just the whole thing. Yeah, it's They're really still strange. Trying to figure it out. For a while they thought it was the dad, but then everything kind of pointed to mom. She's mm -hmm. nuts. She was nuts. She's dead now. Even the handwriting, the handwriting was in right. her writing. Right. With the, yeah. with the stationary from. Her drawer. Yeah. Right. It's pretty nuts. Let's not worry about it. Mom's dead. They said they were the kids sure dead. That a lot of people were saying it was the mom. Yeah. I thought it was the mom from the beginning. She's a. She's silly. Yeah. Different. Yep. Different. There we go. There we go. Different. <laughs> Instructions informing them of the importance of making a correct decision decrease the guessing and the incidence of false identification. So if you tell them they have to make a decision, they will. Mm -hmm. And the probability that they make the wrong decision, well, there may not be a decision to make. So they, it has to be a wrong decision. I but you a, can't I niece, force them. I have a niece when she gets off the bus, she'll be like, Auntie, there was some kids that were mean to me. I was like, some kids? 
Now, were these some kids, you know, male or female? She's like, it was this girl. I mean, it was these three boys. <laughs> so I'm like, oh. I'm not gonna believe it right now. It's caught yourself in the light. Yeah, three boys, a girl. <laughs> I was like, oh, stop it! I was like, what did I tell you about being a tattletale like that? Let me think Don't about do that. that. It was Travis. <laughs> he locked himself in the house. <laughs> Most child sexual abuse uh, cases rest solely on the words of the victim because these cases typically lack physical evidence, and of course, this is the problem with the rape case. Uh, as far as uh, Christine Blasey Ford is concerned. Uh, she was, it was an attempted rape, it wasn't a completed rape. Um, she was afraid for her life because he was covering her mouth, uh, according to her story. Uh, so the, the question is, does that mean anything? I mean, so do we, what do we do about it? Is there anything we can do about it now? Should he be a member of the Supreme Court if he actually did this? Now, of course, I, I don't know if anybody's read the news today, but there are more accusations against him. We have the, we have the uh, lady in the high school, 15-year-old, when she was 15 years old in high school. We have the college freshman uh, at Yale. Now there are two other uh, uh, accusations that have come out. If it's a pattern, I wouldn't want someone like that in that, just, you know, deciding chair. He might be sympathetic and biased to people that are right. like him. Right, that, that are like him. Good, good point. This is really kind of interesting because we see other individuals who have patterns of this type of behavior. Bill Cosby mm -hmm. was was a uh, would uh, knock women out and then rape them, and he did this for mm -hmm. decades, and nobody did anything about it. Uh, uh, Weinstein, uh, Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. Uh, he he uh, raped and molested women for years because he was in charge of the uh, of the uh, uh, the filming and the filming group that he was a member of. Uh, they, they used to call it the casting couch. You had to have sex with the guy that was in charge in order to get a, a part in a in a movie. Uh, and Harvey Weinstein pulled that stunt on 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 women over and over and over again. He tried to do it with his stars. It didn't work as well with the stars. But there are a lot of women that have accused him of rape, of um, sexual molestation. But this is a pattern that has gone on for an extended length of time. Potentially, we see the same thing with the president. But it, I mean, we only have accusations against the president. And most people are, are pretending, since he's the president, that, uh, that, that this didn't happen. We saw the same thing with Bill Clinton. We saw a pattern of of sexual abuse, of, of sexually uh, uh, seducing or attempted sedu seduction of women. Uh, but we ignored it, and now we, we've got another situation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where this is going to stop, or whether we're going to go back to what, what we were before. Harvey Weinstein's, um, Donald Trump's, uh, Bill Cosby's. Uh, he's, He's funny, everybody likes him, he's sold millions of records, he's on television, so let's just ignore the fact that this guy is drugging and raping women. I don't know if that's where we're headed, uh, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. And I'll keep you posted, okay. I know, and who's gonna be the next guy arrested for this kind of behavior? People are losing their jobs, uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, is, is gay, and he has, has uh, seduced and, and molested uh, young actors, and now he, he, uh, he's lost his job. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to watch him on television anymore. Why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time.